Good evening, everyone who isn't here. Um, the next concept in our little lexicon gala is the concept of revolution. And what I'm going to do is that I present quickly three, I give a run through, through three different concepts of revolution and try to connect them to our present moment. But the good thing is that if I mess that bit up, you'll still learn something about those three notions of revolution that perhaps is um, of a bit longer duration um, of validity. So the first is the political revolution, the second is a dialectical notion of revolution, and then I talk a little bit very tentatively about what I call interstitial revolution. What's political revolution? Political revolutions are events of popular sovereignty. Of course, the grand model for it is the French Revolution, which for us signifies a moment of collect collective self-organization and even the birth of collective self-rule. It means that as a nation or a population takes control of decision-making and also of what it is that decisions are made on. That's a constitutive process during which the political body even um, fashions or constitutes itself. The, the key example for that is the emergence of the French people in the storming of the Bastille, where from le peuple, the crowd that did that, emerged the people, the nation, that henceforth was seen um, responsible for its own fate. In light of this idea of revolution as a collective constitutive process, the COVID pandemic presents us with the political or even the anti-political body from hell. I don't, I don't, um, I think we can sort of see exactly the opposite of a constitutive process at the moment. It doesn't trigger popular sovereignty, but the epidemic triggers an older, darker form of sovereignty, the Hobbesian sovereignty that stood at the beginning of modern statehood and is more suited to absolutist rule than to democracy. The virus reactivates something like the original scene of modern statehood in that it reminds us of that first premise of Hobbes' Leviathan that we are all equal, but we're equal for the rather sinister reason that we might all kill each other. And so in light of that egalitarianism of fear or egalitarianism of viral fear, we need a sovereign. We need something to protect us from each other. We need something that separates us in little atomized cells um, and gets us out of touch. And here we are. That's the kind of authority or rule that is flourishing at the moment and for good um, epidemiological reasons while COVID um, is conquering the world. I still find it amazing how little critical theory that I have read in the last weeks has managed even to mourn that loss as necessary as to some extent it might be of the world, of our public sphere, of everything that popular sovereignty and political revolutions conquered for people to assemble and to congregate, to shape their lives, that, that kind of shrinking of our whereabouts to whatever home we're lucky to, might be, might be lucky to be having. I think there is something like a, like a staggering indolence, I don't know whether that's a word in English, like a loss, a lack of pain in the face of that loss of the common world. Um, I've read several pieces of critical theory where us writers who of course love um, to be left alone even revel in ideas of individual monastic life, but that's, I mean, that's not politics, that's not revolutionary, and I must say I find it terrible that I'm speaking here to the bookshelves across and not to an audience I can see. In fact, the only good piece I've read on the loss of our world was written by Salome Balthus, who's a Berlinian sex worker. 
they might have noticed something that critical theory will for a long time, I think, catch up on, on realizing. So nevertheless, even though the virus seems to empty all the spaces in which and the public architectures, the practices through which modern revolutionary democratic sovereignty had emerged, it might bring us at least the trace of connectedness. I mean, it, it's a negation of parts of social life due to distancing, but it produces a certain kind of connectedness. It's a connectedness because somehow with this damn virus, we all have the same thing that we're interested in. There's something that, that combines our focus, something that everyone discusses in a very transnational and in a very kind of intense way. So this very private isolation in which we're driven also makes us reach out and makes us curious in experiences of other people that maybe form something like a new collective. And yet I think the fact that this collective is locked at home and mediated through platforms which already hold the key and the passwords to new forms of sovereignty against which Hobbes Leviathan is rather a small fish is also in itself frightening. What's more, it the lockdown intensifies a division between those of us who are sort of fearing the plague and who are controlled to not contamine each other, but who are at least not themselves seen as the embodiment of the threat of the danger of the virus that needs to be kept outside and needs to be given no shelter within our neatly divided um, space. So when, when Foucault famously talked about the um, plague lockdown and its relation to state of nature thinking, then he thought it overcame a previous way of dealing with epidemics that we had in, with, with leper, where you excluded people and it started the new regime of discipline. And I think at the moment we actually have both of them. We have the exclusion of the lepers at the European borders and we have the discipline of the plague um, within our countries. And yet rather accidentally as this virus affected collectivity which reaches across the division because the leper and the plague um, affected are the same that they're suffering from the same threat of the same virus it makes us see that there are other things we can do that we didn't think we could like stopping to fly or drastically lower air pollution so and in, in less sadistic countries than Germany, we can even pay some of the population something resembling a basic income. So there are little traces of a sort of new body politic, but it has no way of taking control of itself. But those, those are just glimpses of something that potentially could be a shared political horizon. It's far from a revolutionary breakthrough. So how could such a breakthrough happen? And I'm going to move to the, the second model, which has a very clear answer to that, and that's the dialectical understanding of revolution, which thinks of revolutions as something that can happen to the social whole precisely because it is a whole, a totality, which revolves around the central contradiction. So because our social whole is structured by a certain failed promise or incompatibility, it can be that, that, kind, that 
can be the leverage point to move, to shift the whole thing to something else. And famously, with, with regard to the sort of critique of capitalism that Marx brought forward in the model of revolution, he read off the French Revolution. This contradiction has something of the, of the shape of a promise of, a, of political power and political ideals, like in the French Revolution, the ideals of equality, um, um, liber liberté, égalité, fraternité, so um, freedom, equality, and sisterhood. And the reality that partially fulfills them and constantly underlines them at the same time. So because the material context of, in which that promise was first formulated is one of capitalist class relations, then the equality that is both promised by the political ideals and also partially realized at the moment of the labor contract, where indeed the capitalist and the worker both have the right to sign the agreement, then in the next moment, this equality is lost because at the end of the workday, one of them um, can count his gains, whereas the other goes home as poor as they came in the morning. So this, this promise is, is there, it's even partially practically realized, but it's also made impossible by the material context in which it's set. And if we want to, this is a very elaborate model of revolution, obviously, one that requires a lot of interpretation until you have your social whole um, described in a way that, that makes you see and trust such a contradiction. And I don't know whether there is a valid description of our current crisis that lives up to that aspiration. That something that, that some observers have started um, formulating and that I find promising is to think that the current moment is a crisis not so much of production but of reproduction because certain normative expectations that we have come partly through a kind of first world comfort in, in the um, European um, rich industrial societies partly through a however hypocritical humanitarian discourse and um, through the certain type of sacralization of um, life um, in human rights discourse, there are some, some new liberal standards that we've got so used to that seeing them undermine even at home, even in our own societies, is shocking to the point of impossibility. So the fact that we have to reproduce the exclusions we anyway the whole time draw up at the borders within our um, population of the, the hospitals where the, the decisions are made between who is worth reanimating and who isn't. Um, so it creates a situation where the, the promise of protection and the promise of, of shelter that those societies give to their members are undermined in a way that points out that we might be have, have might be um, formulating the ideals of equal dignity and, and rights to live in a reproductive material reality that can never fulfill them and that will keep undermining them. And um, the, the hope in this crisis would be that the, the sacralized right to live isn't just defined ever more restrictively for certain kinds of population or just cynically given up as it is in the new Malthusian politics in, in Brazil and Texas, if you want, but might be um, seen as that unfulfillable promise that at least points us to solutions such as socializing um, all private 
hospitals and not just I think one cruise ships what they they did in Italy so already start um, and immediately tripling the pay of care workers but starting from the health sector to see that the the way that we um, provide goods through market logics will never stand the crises that are ahead of us and this contradiction might have something of the sort of the dialectical um, potential and yet it lacks the agent that might realize it in the world because it, it was sort of um, shaky enough how, how Marx founded his theory of revolution in the proletarian workforce but the the reproductive revolutionary subject doesn't seem to be a collective that is already there and also seems to be incongruent with just that vague political figure of connected, buried, um, news checking, um, coronavirus fearing people that I, I sketched in the, in the first part about the political revolution. So where, how to think about radical change and revolution in the absence of a clear subject or agent of that change. And that brings me to the third notion of revolution, which um, is something that I thought and wrote about quite a bit in the last years. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm more convinced now of it, um, that it becomes a bit more um, more clear that we're losing the even the assembly space for a, a big unified revolutionary subject. But the idea of the third um, notion of revolution that I want to talk about is the idea of interstitial change, which sees the revolution as a process that is um, of a long duration and is starting from many different points and from small cracks and niches in the social totality. And this um, mul multiple or dispersed revolutionary subject, of course, needs to grow into a political force. And the, the idea of that would be that there need to be certain conditions in place in which some emerging marginal or, um, or interstitial practice can be inserted so that something on the on the bigger level of society tips over and if we don't if we don't produce that from one core contradiction then can we maybe con produce that from many different sites at once and I don't think that there's much hope from all the little private interstitial households into which we're stuffed at the moment and yet I think that um, this suffocating focus on mere survival that the virus creates could be a structure that as much as it tends as I said at the beginning towards an authoritarian lockdown solution it might also be bear have the, have the potential for being tipped over to the side of something that I would call a revolution for life and that could connect with practices of social movements that have been long underway and that have started mobilizing in recent years around the figure of life and survival. I'm thinking of, of forces such as Black Lives Matter that starts mobilizing from the deadly murderous police violence against Black people also Ni Una Menos, so the feminist movement that starts from femicide and then gets to analysis of the social whole from there and also um, stages reproductive strikes um, that lead towards something like a collective that could become the revolutionary subject of the, the big contradiction around reproduction. Um, but also the radical climate movement and, and, and environmental agents that mobilize against the 
way in which capitalism destroys our shared um, conditions of livelihood. So those different movements connect to something that is ambivalent and also very politically dangerous in the virus, but might also be appropriated for ecological feminist socialism to come. And um, the, some, some of these forces also interestingly start to, to integrate and interact. I'm thinking of a recent example here in Germany where the climate movement that used to stage their protests in um, protective gear has now sent all that protective gear to the border to a refugee to the terrible refugee camps um, on Lesbos, so that people there could be protected against the virus, which crosses that division between the plagues and the lepers and also different struggles that you would think are connected to different crises, but but can somehow start revolving around this, the, the same contradiction of how we can reproduce ourselves in a free, equal, and um, especially solidaric way. The projects that we hope you might be moved to donate to are exactly in line with this idea of a revolution for life, and um, both Project Shelter and Medico International are doing amazing work in, in that way. So thank you for supporting their work, and thank you for listening to mine.